as you're joining our webinar for today. For those of you who are coming in, I'll give you guys time to come in. If I have not had a chance to meet you, I'm Dottie Summerfield Justy, and it is my pleasure to be the co-chair, one of the co-chairs for the Small Business Council for the Greater Memphis Chamber. And as we were thanking our panelists today, I'm going to thank you attendees who are coming in so quickly for your flexibility in turning your cars around from the Baptist Hospital to join us on a virtual meeting today. Um, we have about 90 people who have signed up to join us. So I'd like to wait just a few minutes uh, before we begin our full meeting. Um, this is our, this was to be our second in-person meeting of the year. The Small Business Council has been extremely busy over the past two and a half years. Uh, last year, we presented over 14 meetings and we're on track to this year to give the small businesses of our city and surrounding area at least one program a month, either virtual, in-person or a series of meetings. So for those of you who have joined us for the first time for a Small Business Council meeting, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, again, I'm Jeff Kimbrough with Independent Bank. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank the Small Business Council for continuing to um, move on with our Lunch and No series. You know, it's been a it's been a little different these past couple of years, but you know, we truly appreciate you guys uh, carrying on and keeping this series going. Um, even though we are virtual, uh, I feel that we're getting closer and closer to being in person. Uh, I was looking forward to it this week, but I think next time we might we might be there. Uh, so looking forward to seeing you guys pretty soon. Um, as title sponsor, uh, just want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, and let you know that you know if we can be of service to you or your business, uh, we'll be glad to connect to connect with you. Um, I'll try to leave my contact information in the uh, chat system uh, later on in the presentation. Um, that way it's available to anyone that um, would like to have access to it. Um, and again, please reach out to us. Our team at Independent Bank would be, gr be gladly appreciated to reach out to you. Uh, so again, thanks to everyone for joining us and look forward to hearing today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia, let me just jump in real quickly before we introduce our other sponsors. Um, looks like the majority of everybody has joined in. Can I ask those of you who are attendees, if you don't mind, in your name, can you put your company name so we know who you're with, with whom you represent, if you don't mind, and we welcome everyone again. Thank you. Patricia, back to you. All right. Thank you. And our next sponsor is United Healthcare. And from United Healthcare, we have Dave Wiles. Dave, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Great, great. I had some technical difficulties getting in, but and I'm still trying to get my camera to work. So you can see that I don't have three heads coming out of my body or anything like that. So well, we hear um, you loud and clear, Dave. Okay, great. Thank you, Patricia. I appreciate it. Well, well, good, out, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is David Wiles with United Healthcare, and I am uh, just we're, we're happy to be in 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 the program again. Uh, and um, United Healthcare is offering uh, a great traditional uh, level funded product to all the members of the chamber. And uh, there's already been some success I've seen with uh, people taking advantage of some savings that they couldn't get if they weren't otherwise members of the chamber. So um, there's over 800,000 members on this product. Uh, we expect it to be at a million members here by, the, by this time next year. And uh, th there's it's it, there's an opportunity for for members to get some money back if you're if the losses of your group are um, you know meet a lower threshold than what than the average. So 40% of the groups are getting money back, and um, that's that's a great a great story. And hopefully people are getting a little bit healthier as we you know move along through through the course of lives and such. So. Um, I just wanted to just 
tell you to go reach out to your broker and um, let them know that you're a member of the chamber and, and they'll, they will get their proposals uh, through us, through the chamber program. So thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you so much. Um, we are very thankful for our sponsors that allow us to have programming like these to help our small business sector. Now we want to jump into our conversation and I have the pleasure of introducing uh, one of our panelists, Amity Schuyler. Amity is Senior Vice President of the Workforce Development um, Department at the Greater Memphis Chamber. And Amity oversees the Workforce Development uh, team. And, and I'm scrolling down here. I apologize for that. I had a little snafu, Amity. Oh, we lost so Amity, okay. so she creates, yeah, I'm sorry. So she creates the alignment of academic institutions and workforce development organizations. Amity brings a deep understanding of the needs of business and industry leaders as she has the important uh, job of having those systems and policy alignments, uh, and they're crucial. They're a crucial component in creating workforce and talent pipelines for a community. Amity has a long history of engagement with business and community in 20 years of cabinet level and CEO roles in the nonprofit, state, and local government sectors. Amity, the floor is yours. Hey, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. So glad you could carve some time out of your day to spend it with us in this important discussion. Um, I think that time and the availability of it is one of our greatest assets and shortest resources now and day. Uh, so trust me when I say we do not take for granted that, um, that uh, you are with us. Can you all see my screen? Yes, no, possibly? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Let's go into presentation mode then. How about now? Even better? Oh, presentation all good? mode. All good. Thank you. Beautiful. Well, first thing I wanted to level set with is just one thing. We're back and we're back in a big way as a region. Um, in case you missed the headline or you haven't heard it because your head's down and you've got so much going on. Not only has Memphis regained all the jobs from before the pand pandemic, we have more jobs than ever before in our market. Um, so I really want to challenge your thinking and um, encourage you to challenge the water cooler talk and the thinking of your colleagues around those narratives that people just don't want to come back to work or that for some reason stimulus money kept them from coming back to work or that um, you know, people just don't wanna work first. Um, I think that deficit-based narrative is not healthy for our community. I can see who's on this call today and I know that you all agree to me and I'm kind of preaching to the choir. But second, it also uh, takes away from the real story. And the real story is, is that we are a growing region. We're a growing economy. Um, the entire country is looking at us because our cost of living is still cheaper than usual. The cost of staffing and employment is still cheaper than usual, even though I know you've had, many of you have had to raise your rate, your wages. And we have, we are a growing economy. And so Memphis is rising. This is our moment. And we should all celebrate that for just a minute. So you've got a great panel today. And I just want to talk a little bit about where the chamber lives and workforce. If you think about the chamber as the connective tissue between all the systems that you're going to hear about today, that's probably the best way to describe our role. So the chamber lives in the space really of trying to support the, and it, the improvement of job quality and access and developing and coordinating workforce strategies and policies that create a functional workforce system. What that means is, is that in terms of your private sector representative, we want that speed of need workforce that continues to allow you all to either sustain expand and grow and certainly allows us as the economic development and recruitment organization for the region to be able to attract quality businesses to Memphis that are going to provide quality jobs so that we're rising the tide for everyone. Remember the chamber's vision is to create prosperity for all and we can't do that unless we have quality jobs for people to step into. But in order for them to be able to step into those jobs, they have to have the skills to get them. 
And so when we are talking about workforce at the chamber, and just let me say that my colleague Sandra Howell here is on the call with us, we're really thinking about a systemic change and alignment. The chamber doesn't do programs, we do systems. And our primary goal as representatives and the voice of the private sector is to look across that landscape and make sure that all of those systems are working and producing, first for the people that are in them, and second, of course, for the needs of the regional economy. So we've been talking about adult opportunities to upscale with accelerated skills pathways and credentials to maximize that civilian labor force. So if there's one thing we are rich in in the Memphis metropolitan statistical area is human capital. We have a very robust human capital labor force. But the reality is, is that across all of the counties in the MSA, about 50% of all adults only have a high school diploma as the terminal degree. Now, our school systems and state policies are working hard to get more people on the college pathway, but the reality is the adults that did not persist into that post-secondary opportunity, they need an on-ramp to get more skills and more credentials to get better paying and quality jobs, and you all need a skilled workforce. And so looking at the adult education opportunities across the area, they're not as robust as in other areas of Tennessee. So in partnership with many of the folks that you'll hear on this um, panel today, we are spending a lot of time in creating more access, more on-ramps, more capacity in the accelerated skills pathways for adult credentialing. That also means that we need a one-stop front door access for training and wraparound supports. So our American Job Centers can only go so far with that training and wraparound support. Um, that is one organization under one roof. What we need for people in Memphis that is common in many metropolitan areas that Memphis does not have is a front door access for all things skills training and wraparound support. So imagine a roof where there are multiple entities, whether that's social security and colleges and training partners and one representative from daycare. It's not necessarily where all the services are going to be given, but it's the place where one person can go into one door and they can walk out with a clear pathway with all the things they need to get more training, to get a better job, to be married to an education partner, or even seek a degree. Um, so we've been talking a lot about that front door access and how we bring that one-stop concept to Memphis first with one property and then a second property, both located in opportunity zones. And then the full utilization of our workforce entitlement funds. We have a workforce development board and you'll hear from Kyla Guyat later. We have the largest allotment um, traditionally of workforce development funds that come from the federal government to the state government, to the local region, to skill, upskill, support, high opportunity populations. And traditionally we haven't been spending them. So it's really nobody's fault that's happening all across the state, but we know that if we can create more quick turn, accessible training programs and accessible locations, we can use that money for it's what it's intended for. And that's really to provide economic mobility for the people that need it the most. And then near and dear to my heart, students utilizing work-based learning and dual enrollment benefits. So many of you on this call may not know um, that the state really has some great systems and infrastructure to help develop employee pipelines. We just haven't been pulling all of the levers here in the Memphis region across our many counties. So let's think about this for a second. I just wanna make sure you have the inventory of availability. So first, Students in 11th and 12th grade can be scheduled in up to three work-based learning opportunities per year. So for every one class they take of work-based learning, they, are, they can do 10 hours in a workplace. So in 11th and 12th grade in the high school schedule, a student can actually work 30 hours a week to get three credits of high school coursework. Um, and for many students, um, that would be welcome news. Now, that doesn't work if high schools have nowhere to schedule them into. And when I say nowhere, I mean the workplace. So we'll be working over the next year to build the capacity of our businesses to host students in work-based learning opportunities in the workplace. And guess what? It doesn't have to be during the, the school week. It could actually also be during the weekend, but the student still gets the classroom credit. Juxtapose with that work-based learning opportunity, there's dual enrollment. So on January 1st, the state now pays for 10, 10, 30 credit hours, 10 courses of dual enrollment for free. 
And that's not just for a community college or university, that's also for a TCAT. So thinking about and working with employers to think about how they build earlier pipelines, getting their arms around a potential workforce earlier, building those relationships, supporting them in dual enrollment, allowing them to have that work-based learning opportunity is a necessary long-term strategy to create that long-term pipeline. And then we're talking a lot about STEM. I'm going to talk more about that anyway, so I won't, I won't spend too much time there. And then policy changes like our Industry 4.0 diploma. Um, we, we have a policy team at the Chamber, and the reality is, is that we're looking at necessary policy changes all the way into education systems to government systems to really think about what needs to be fixed, tweaked, calibrated, or eliminated that is standing in the way or keeping us from growing the, the most skilled, most productive workforce in the Mid-South. Um, so this is kind of where we eat, sleep, and breathe as your chamber. Again, the connective tissue around all of the systems that you're going to hear about today. When we say workforce ecosystem, I hope you're thinking about it in this way. Um, traditionally, employers have just had to advertise, interview, hire. That's not what's going to happen anymore. Your workforce development strategy is not a social service program. It is a talent pipeline development. And your talent pipeline development needs to include a grow your own local strategy in addition to all of your outward bound recruitment may be out of region. So I hope that you're thinking about your workforce ecosystem all the way back to kindergarten, all the way through your talent recruitment efforts. What do you have to do with K through five or six to eight? You might be wondering. Well, let me ask, when was the last time you participated in a career day? When was the last time you were inside of a classroom to let teachers know and, and students understand what it is that your industry brings to the table? What kind of career paths are in there? How do you get those careers? What kind of classes do you take? What should you be interested in? Um, if you like certain things, what does that make you suitable for in your industry? These are the things that you need to be investing in in that K through eight classroom environment. So if you don't have a ground game, in that K-8 environment, you don't necessarily have the best pipeline development strategy possible. And if you need a connection into those classrooms, we can certainly help you with that. In that 9-12 space, we talked a lot about work-based learning, dual enrollment. Our mantra is by 11th grade, and that's when work-based learning becomes available. That's when dual enrollment becomes available. By 11th grade, every student should be in a work-based learning and or dual enrollment environment, period period. Students need to learn about work at work. And here's why. And you all know this. The workplace is advancing rapidly. Let's just talk about manufacturing in our local industries. A Yaskawa robotic arm costs $500. A Fanuc robotic arm costs about $700. Welding machines, machining equipment, medical lab equipment, that's all extremely expensive equipment. The school districts are not going to be able to keep up with, and they shouldn't have to. The workplace should be welcoming students into the space so that they are learning in the workplace on the latest and greatest equipment and in the, um, in the space where the advancements are occurring. So I want you to be thinking about that strategy. In the adult education space, we're talking about accelerated skills. But again, who is your partner in your adult education space for upskilling, credentialing? And if you don't have one, you're going to need one, and we can help with that. And then certainly when you're talking about a full workforce ecosystem, the traditional spaces, your technical and state colleges, universities, and then your upskill opportunities and recruitment. So this is where we live as your chamber. And um, if you feel like you're weak in one of these spaces, that's all right. Um, you know, we come from 10 years of a recession where it was, there was no problem in finding what you needed. Um, if there's anything that you hear from the call today, I hope it's that you're going to have to live a little better in all of these spaces, and we're here to support you with that. So be thinking about that. And then you're going to hear us talk a lot about STEM. Um, if you were at our mid-year meeting, you heard our Prosper Memphis goals, and that is to create 20,000 STEM credentials and graduates every single year. Would anybody like to guess what the current number of STEM output is that we're producing as a region? Go ahead and put it in the chat. Anyone? I can't see the chat, so somebody's got to read it out for me. We have any response? Hang on a Dottie? second. I'm trying. Yeah. I'm putting 200, but I cheat because I understand some of it. 
<laughs> and I'm the only one brave enough to put something in at the moment. So there Come you on go. Now. Yeah. My two All right. All right. Well, first, let's talk about why STEM. All right. We are a manufacturing advanced industry region. Um, and when we stay industry 4.0, people automatically go to factories and manufacturing, but that's really not the case. Industry 4.0 is really a coin phrase for the fourth industrial revolution. And if you know anything about your American history, you know what happens in industrial revolutions. The technology comes into the manufacturing space first, but that technology informs every other workspace across every other job and industry on the face of the planet. So what's happening in manufacturing right now is that artificial intelligence, cloud-based management, the internet of things, um, robotics, pneumatics, you name it, all of that technology is advancing very rapidly. And it's going to require the type of employee that needs to have digital skills, computing skills, um, critical thinking skills, but most importantly, STEM skills. Some of the jobs that are going to come out of Industry 4.0 aren't even titled yet. They don't even have job descriptions. But what we do know is that STEM is at the foundation of every single one of them, whether that was strong STEM exposure in public school and a high school diploma or a STEM credential or a STEM two-year or a STEM four-year or postdoctorate. STEM matters to our region more than ever before, first for economic competitiveness and second for the employers that are already here. But the entire nation is also in a STEM crisis. We kind of fell asleep at the wheel um, and we realized that we've got to produce more talent in this space. STEM credentials and degrees and STEM exposure also leads to innovation, entrepreneurship, patents. Those are the things that put communities and countries on the map and keep them regionally and globally competitive. That's why you're going to be hearing so much conversation around STEM. That's why we're talking a lot about STEM exposure. And we don't just want STEM exposure, we want STEM equity as well. So when we talk about STEM and pivoting our human capital pipeline, we're really talking about a very, very robust regional strategy that first starts with building, building the STEM talent to teach STEM talent. Does that make sense? You can't have more STEM if you don't have STEM teachers. You can't have more STEM if you don't have STEM credentials. You can't have more computer and coding and robotics if you don't have the people to teach it. Um, and so making sure that we're growing a talent consortium of individuals that we can embed inside of their pipeline that you already saw that can duplicate those skills and, and maximize our talent. And then this should look like our workforce ecosystem. This looks familiar, right? But instead of everything, we're focusing on STEM. So that three to eight pipeline, teacher externships, student exploration in careers and robotics and STEM fields, um, more STEM experiences in the after school and summer space, as well as STEM field trips so that they can see it, touch it, dream it so they can be it. When you get to that 915 pipeline, we want to start producing credentials. So when a student graduates from high school, they're graduating with their diploma, they're graduating with a real industry credential that gives them current in the workplace and maybe also they're also graduating with some dual enrollment credits if they're going into college. There's no reason that that can't happen. I don't know a single educator in our space or school district that doesn't want that to happen. It absolutely requires the support and alignment and partnership of the private sector, however, to make that happen. And then the learning environment making sure that the learning environments are the best learning environments across our whole system from Haywood to the river so that everybody is getting a similar experience in their STEM education. And that goes into that, that equity piece as well. Um, and I won't go too deep into the credentials, but when we talk about producing STEM credentials, we're talking about coding and software and computing. We're talking about robotics engineering and electric mobility. And we can talk about what Ford means to this system and what's coming in behind Ford. Um, those pre engineering and engineering degrees, they are going to be in massive demand moving forward. Mm -hmm. Data analysis and data governance, PMP, project management, is one of the fastest growing careers in our space right now, as well as Lean Six. Both of those do not require a college degree. Entrepreneurship, hydraulics, pneumatics, fluid power, all that 3D and additive and advanced manufacturing. And then that industry 4.0 internet of things. If you don't know what that is, go ahead and Google it because you're going to hear a lot about it across industries across the board.
So, and then we eat, sleep, and breathe here. These are some of our funnest things. <laughs> Industry councils. We just had a manufacturing council talking about their pipeline, the math behind the output, and thinking about what they need else, to, what else they need to do to produce um, an earlier, stronger pipeline. We manage trailing spouses, so collecting the resumes of trailing spouses, distributing them across the ecosystem um, is one of our most fun things to do because we love to matchmake. That pipeline development, we can provide that technical assistance um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, basis, looping in a lot of the partners that are going to be on this call today, by the way, and then that intern externship design. Again, we have teachers and externships as we speak. It's so exciting to know that um, employers opened their doors to teachers so that they can better understand and support their um, their career development needs as they go back into their classroom. So the, I did that relatively quickly. I know that we are going to... Um, be having a conversation after this and I we have lots I'm, of good presentations gonna, that will follow. I'm gonna jump back in real quickly. Angela Whit Whitelow, Whitlow, Whitelaw. Whitelaw. Jumped in and said she thought there were five hundred STEM graduates. So just need to add one zero. I knowing Angela, she knew it was five thousand and forgot the zero. Gotcha. Way to I go, think. Whitelaw. <laughs> All right. Well, Amity, thank you so much for that wealth of knowledge. And if anyone wants to reach out to you for more information, they can reach out to your team, right? Yes, our team of two. Um, but we're small and mighty because really our space is in connective tissue and relationships, right? So working across systems, making sure that everybody is leveraging their full capacity and helping them to do that is really where we eat, sleep and breathe. Awesome. Thank you so much. Now, next, our next panelist is Kyla Guyette. Kyla is the president of Workforce Mid-South and executive di director of uh, Greater Memphis Local Workforce Development Board. And Kyla uh, actually oversees the workforce development funding and initiatives in the four county area of Shelby, Fayette, Tipton, and Lauderdale counties of West Tennessee. With the formation of Workforce Mid-South, Kyla is charged with spearheading a revitalization of workforce development in the Mid-South, bridging public and private initiatives for a robust new vision for the region. She brings over 15 years of experience in workforce programming and a specialization in serving multi-barrier individuals and young adults. Kyla? Hi, everybody. Happy lunchtime uh, for all of you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I, I really echo most of what Amity already talked about. We're heavily involved and partnered with the Chamber in a lot of those efforts and a lot of the work that's happening right now to really talk about a more robust and more effective workforce ecosystem uh, for a really long time is very transactional. Uh, you have a job opening, you come in, we help you fill it, end of transaction, right? Um, and we didn't have a lot of conversation about how do we make sure the entire ecosystem is functioning so that we are producing individuals that will meet that talent pipeline in the future? How are we moving folks from one opportunity to the next with upscaling opportunities? It's, it's a much larger conversation that we now are having and I think really starting to make some headway on. And Memphis is getting quite a lot of attention nationally from folks uh, just because they see the changes happening in the system. So that's good for everybody. Um, but I really wanna talk a little bit tactically about some of the things that we as the workforce board are able to do for small business in particular. So we of course are, let's make sure this is gonna advance forward. There you go. Uh, workforce Mid-South is a dual entity. So we not only are the workforce board, which operates all of that Department of Labor funding that comes down from the feds to the state to us to run those American job centers. You may be familiar with the AJCs, but we also are a nonprofit entity that is looking at our whole pipeline across the Mid-South to make sure we are filling the gaps, we are future planning, we are doing all of those things uh, to be robust. And so we do sure, serve financially Shelby, Fayette, Lauderdale, and Tipton. There are American job centers in all of those locations, but we also have 58 access points throughout 
These are community partner locations that American Job Center services are being offered within those agencies on a scheduled basis. So for instance, to one poplar, or if you were going to go into the child support office, or you already have to go to a partner like Hope Works, you can receive American Job Center services within those agencies without having to travel to our brick and mortars. So that's a little bit of what we're trying to do to make sure that the access to services is as broad as possible. We're also working on some things uh, to get a web portal, a live web, web portal put up so that folks will be able to interact and receive services from wherever they have internet for a lot of our population that tends to be their smartphone. And so you will be able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations and services through your smartphone. But we also were going to have a series of kiosks where folks can go and receive uh, services, not only teleservices, but you can also get gas cards, bus passes, things like that directly issued through the kiosk. So we're continuously rethinking how we are delivering service, are we being equitable in how that delivery is actually happening, and how can we prepare for the future of workforce. So I like to talk because it's the audience and it's what you guys are very interested in. Some of the services that we have directly to businesses. We do a lot for job seekers, but we don't talk enough about what we do for business. And business is the primary customer of this fund. Um, so recruitment screening placement service, similar to what you would get at a traditional um, agency that does this work or through your own HR departments, a lot of small businesses can't afford a separate HR department, right? A recruitment department. And so we do a lot of that work for you, absolutely free of charge. So we will post jobs for you. You can tell us what to screen for. We will screen candidates. We will pre-interview candidates if you would like us to. There are on-site hiring events. Um, we can do any of those types of services that you would like to. We can also ensure folks get uh, drugs tested. They can get background checks, any of that kind of stuff that you would typically do in a recruitment department we can do at the American Job Center free of cost for you. Also on the job training. So if you find a candidate that you would like to hire, they are really good, but for something. So I would really like this candidate, but they need a little bit more training in forklift driving or whatever it happens to be. We will, if that person is qualified for WIAWA before they start with you, we can then uh, set up an on the job training for the period of time that you are training them in that skill, let's say it's six months that you will have to train them, we can pay between 50 and 75% reimbursement of their wages. So that gives you the flexibility and the time maybe to hire someone that is not quite the perfect candidate, but you really feel like they could be with that additional training. So it's a way for our candidates to get that upscaling opportunity and for you to get funded to do that. So incumbent worker training is something is really underutilized in this region. So what that is, if you're a company that's been in business for a year and you have an employee that's been with you at least six months and you would like to upskill that employee, we are able to help fund that. So it's anywhere from 10 to 50% uh, employer share. What's good is that if you're a small business, we actually have uh, up to 90% that we will pay of the cost of training that individual. You only have a 10% share. And a lot of times that 10% comes through the wages that you are paying that employee while they're in training, or it comes through something that you're already gonna do anyway. So it virtually becomes free training and free uh, money to upskill individuals. We like to think of it as long-term layoff aversion. So, but for this skill, this person may not be able to stay employed with me. So let's make sure that we're able to do that. But during the pandemic and post recovery, it's been a lot about retaining employees. So an employee that maybe worked at a front desk, maybe worked at um, the front line of a warehouse, you want to keep them, but that person doesn't want to stay in that particular position for the next 20 years. They want to see that path for growth. And so this is the way that you were able to retain that employee, but still move them through and move them up the career ladder at virtually no cost to you. We're able to really help with that. Um, there is no cap on ITA funding uh, right now. So that allows us to really look at an entire organization. You may have three people you wanna upskill. You may have a hundred folks that you wanna upskill and we can look at how we can help fund that training. 
all the money that we get as a region, up to 20% of that can be used to, for this purpose. And we traditionally, like just for instance, uh, program year is about to end in about 10 days, less than that. And we have $900,000 obligated to employers who have come to us and said, I want to train individuals. I want to upskill. To date, only about $200,000 has actually been billed to us. So there's $700,000 on the table of employers that have been given funds or obligated funds that have not come through with the invoices. So there is always money uh, if you would like to upskill your individuals. So we talked a little bit about OJT. I just want to make sure that we are a lot, we make sure folks know because it always happens. Your person has to get eligible and become eligible at the American Job Center before they actually start work for you. Lots of employers get themselves into that trap and the person starts work and then we are not able to cover that OJT. But if we organize it up on the front end, we're able to significantly help with that wage. So customized training is something that we should be doing a lot more, uh, but we don't as a region. So this is something that does not already exist. A training program, if you were to go to Southwest or TCAT or a private organization that currently is not being offered uh, commercially, you as an employer may have something in-house, a special trainer that if you're manufacturing, you want to have some come over from Germany and train on a special machine. All of that is allowable training that we're able to help fund the cost of. Um, and the employer pays 50 to 80% of the cost, depending on the number of employees. Always, the smaller the business, the smaller your match share is. Uh, we will always pay more for smaller businesses than we do for larger businesses, but we are able to pay for a completely customized training that does not currently exist to you. So we also do a couple of other things that we make sure everybody knows about. Um, we're making sure all of your folks are getting access to work opportunity tax credits. Most of the individuals in our program will qualify for that. So that ends up being a really good savings, um, hiring folks through this program. Federal bonding, we are able to offer bonding for any of our individuals where that becomes an issue. And then apprenticeship programs. Apprenticeships are really a long-term pipeline that in West Tennessee has been far underutilized. Um, East Tennessee is pretty, pretty uh, adept at being able to create apprenticeships, and that's been a really great long-term strategy for them. Um, we are still been slow to adopt, but really have had really good conversations with several industries about how do you future-proof your particular industry by starting apprenticeship programs and making sure that happens. There's actually an apprenticeship director for West Tennessee um, I can connect you to her at any point, and um, you can also contact Workforce Mid-South, and we can help walk you through that process. The Workforce Board has set aside funding that we can pay for the classroom portion of an apprenticeship, and then when they actually go into the hands-on learning part, we can kick in with an OJT, so that reimbursement of wages, 50 to 75 percent of their wages for six months, we can also do that, so it really becomes a, a financially viable option for most industries uh, when we break together all of the funding available. So I also wanted to make sure, Amity talked a little bit about work-based learning, and I think that's also something that we are underutilized a good bit. So we talked about our kids going into work-based learning opportunities with employers. We actually have funding to pay the wages of a young person for them to do that work-based learning at your business. So as long as you have five employees at your business, you can be eligible to become a workplace site um, and host young adults from top, typically 400 hours. Sometimes it's a little longer um, depending on the situation, but at least 400 hours for a young adult. They can be both in-school kids and those that have already graduated or dropped out, so out of school youth. And we will pay market rate. So it used to be $12 an hour. And now it has become whatever the starting wage of your entry level employees in that position would be. And for a lot of things, that it's surprisingly, that could be $21 in a lot of our locations now, $17 an hour, um, because we're trying to help the young adults really uh, integrate into the work system. And a work-based learning is there to teach marketable skills, um, transferable skills, really get that experience in a workplace. And like Amity said, you don't learn work skills in a school, you learn work skills at work. Um, and so we are there always 
to fund those opportunities for up to about 400 young adults throughout our region every year. Uh, we also have recently been awarded some additional TANA funding that we're able to do even more of those opportunities for young adults that don't qualify for WIOA, but are typically in low income areas. We can provide work experience. And we also are a recipient uh, with the University of Memphis of growth funds. That's a $25 million grant from Tennessee Department of Human Services, where we're gonna serve 2000 low income families and help connect them to all of the things we have been talking about. So those upskilling opportunities, work experience, um, credentialing, everything that we are really saying we need to provide for true economic mobility. So don't just think of the workforce board as the traditional American job center. It really has become a much larger engine of workforce development within the region. And I always say, if there's something that you need and it's not currently on our website or you don't think we offer it, please reach out to us because there may be an opportunity that we can present to offer that opportunity, that service to you. I have my, uh, email my contact address, uh, contact information on the screen. Also, Roderick Woody is our business services manager. So anything related to business, he is usually your first and best contact. He handles all of those accounts and his team is able to quickly get you the information that you would need to get. I'm also going to put into the chat, there is a state of Tennessee website. We'll put the link in. If you want to take advantage of any of those business grants that we talked about, incumbent worker, OJT, apprenticeship, you initiate a contact form through that state link. They always want you to contact them first. They will funnel that to the local workforce board and we will take it from there helping to walk you through the process. But the first step is always a contact through that state link. So I will put that in the chat as well. Wow. Kyla, thank you. And I'm going to kind of go off script for just a second here. We've had two questions directed to you. Sure. The first one was from Wyatt Smith. Where should we go to learn more on the eligibility criteria for candidates? And then Kim Bond, if you can do this in 45 seconds, are there restrictions on private employees and government employees for access to these funds or programs? Yeah. Um, Kim, that's actually easy. No, there's no restriction on the type of employer. We can do it for any employer. Um, the two things that matter, if it is going to be OJT funds, so that is when we are reimbursing wages prior to you hiring them kind of thing, the eligibility rests upon the individual participant. So we have to make that individual qualified. If we're talking about incumbent worker funds, that's where you're upskilling current employees, it does not matter the eligibility criteria of the individual employees, the eligibility then comes the business. So it's, it's two different ways that we evaluate. And absolutely, you can go to our website or the state of Tennessee, either one. Um, both of us outline our eligibility criteria. There's eligibility policies that you can look up on the workforcemidsouth.com um, website. I can also get a quick fact sheet out to this group. Um, I can send it to the organizers and they can send all that out to you. That would be incredibly helpful. Thank you very, sure. very much. I appreciate that. Whew. Hope everybody's catching up. And yes, I I did, we, did have, we did have one question in the chat while, while Kyla was speaking. Um, and yes, um, the program is being recorded and it will be available. Hopefully it'll be on the Small Business Council website, part of the chamber and it will be available to you, um, Patricia, and I will be able to have access to it. Thank you, Kyla, very much. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Bakara Malden, who's Chief of Staff for the Memphis Area Transit Authority, Armada. We all know that reliable transportation has been a barrier to workforce and a full workforce for a long time. Uh, the Transit Authority has, is moving forward with new and interesting programs to help us there. Bacara provides strategic leadership and the framework to support the day-to-day -day operations and project management and execution of strategic in initiatives to ensure continued growth and efficiency of MATA. Um, she has over 16 years of diverse experience in public transit, public administration, municipal government, grants administration, and business administration, business operations. We're pleased to have you with us, Bacara. And please come feel free to give us an update on MATA and what MATA means business for our for us and our small businesses. Thank you. 
and you are, if you can unmute, we can see your, your presentation. Okay, I think you unshared your screen and now I, you're back. I did, I you did. did. You know, the best laid plans, you know. That's it. But give me just a second. While Bakar is getting that up, um, and I want to tell our attendees, we have thanked them profusely for being able to jump so quickly um, to having presentations that they didn't plan for for a face-to-face -face meeting. Here we go. Um, we go. There you go, Bakar. It's all all right, can everyone hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can. All right, very yes. good. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Bakara Sanderson Malden, and I am the Chief of Staff for the Memphis Area Transit Authority. Um, I have the pleasure of working with our CEO, who is Mr. Gary Rosenfeld. And I am actually here to give you a brief update and talk to you about how MATA means business. And we really appreciate the invitation to come out and address the Small Business Council um, because MATA does mean business. Now, I just wanna give you some national numbers with regard to transit. You know, for every dollar that is actually invested in public transportation, it has about a $4 return on investment. Uh, for every $1 billion invested in public transportation, that supports and creates about 50,000 jobs um, all across the United States. So of course, I think you all recognize that because I understand that there were a lot of people that may have been looking forward to this update uh, from MATA. And so you know that MATA means business. But of course, you may really wanna know what does this specifically mean for Memphis? It means jobs. It means the growth of businesses like yours. It means a better quality of life for all Memphians. And it means increased property values for those that live in Memphis and, around, and surrounding areas. So MATA does in fact mean business. One of the ways that we uh, mean business and, and one tool that we have to help people that are in business is through our on-demand program that we introduced last year. It has been wildly successful. Uh, we have two micro uh, transit programs. One is the Ready Program which operates in three zones, as well as Groom, which operates in the downtown area, as well as uh, the medical district, the downtown area, uh, as well as New Chicago. And so we are really, really encouraged by the success. The slide that you see kind of shows our ridership to date or the bookings that we've had to date utilizing those programs. Next, I'll show you a slide that has the zones for the READY program. Zone one, which is the Boxtown, Westwood, Whitehaven uh, zone, that has been our most successful. We've had more uh, boardings in that program than we've had in any of our other zones combined. And so we, it is just off the charts and that's a great problem to have. And so we hope that as you all learn more about the services that we provide, we'll have even more boarding in all of our zones. Of course, Groove, as I mentioned, is a partnership between the Memphis Medical District, the Downtown Memphis Commission, and of course, MATA. And so it serves Downtown Medical District, New Chicago, and most recently, President's Island. And in fact, they reached out to us because the employers there were looking for a way to get their employees to work. And so they reached out to us and we were able to expand uh, the existing groove zone to include President's Island. So it's an innovative transportation solution. And by micro transit, as you see, we have the little vans and they pick you up basically from where you are and take you to where you're trying to go within the zone. So it's called a curb to curb service as, a as opposed to the traditional fixed route transit. Now, a lot of people, I understand, you know, we're all excited about the uh, mega site. And I understand that you all have questions with regard to that as well. And of course, I agree, the future of mobility is really, really bright in our region because of the announcement of the Ford mega site. But if we don't take the time to address transportation and to think through transportation, 
that will actually be our future of transportation. So we're, we're really uh, reaching out to our, our stakeholders, our lawmakers, TDOT and everyone else far and in between uh, to make sure that we're included in those conversations. And we have been. And so we're really excited about the direction that things are going. So of course, we're trying to push to have light rail or either a commuter bus system uh, to ensure that Memphians have access to the jobs that will be provided by the creation of the mega site. So it'll be light rail or commuter bus. And, and hopefully after funds are appropriated for the feasibility study, we'll be able to continue uh, with those efforts. So what can you do to help us with that is any, any lawmakers that you all may know, anyone that you are or have access to, let them know that this is important to you so that it'll be important to them. And so that's really my brief update. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. I've now given all of you my business card. And of course, I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have. Uh, on the slide, I actually have the uh, website address. A lot of questions can be answered there, as well as the matter information line. And you can take that number and you can actually hit option two. And if you hit option two, you'll get to a live person and we'll be happy to help you. But it is a great and exciting time at Matter, as it is a great and exciting time in the city of Memphis. Bakara, this is Dottie. I've got just a couple of questions for you. Some sure. of these new programs, especially Ready and Groove, mm -hmm. um, are they operating? What time frame of the day are they operating? They operate from about, I think the first bookings are around 5.30 a.m. and they go until 6 p.m. in the evening. Monday okay. through Saturday. Gotcha. All righty. Um, I think I'd like to bring all three of our panelists back in for a couple of questions and answers. If you don't mind, Bakara, that's it. Stop sharing. And then Kyla, can you and Amity flip your cameras on for us, please? So we can see you and Patricia. Y'all, it's been a while since we've done a program like this, so thank you. There we go. Great. All right. I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, and uh, Bakar brought it up, and this is both for Amity and, and Kyla. Blue Oval, we're all excited that it's coming. It's gonna be exciting. It's gonna be wonderful. They're gonna hire a lot of people. How's it gonna affect our small businesses? Um, as a small business owner and someone in the staffing industry, my clients have a great deal of fear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Or my client, my employee is going to go there. So it's a good and it's bad. Mm -hmm. um, and then, Bakar, we've got a question come from Susan. So, Amity, I'm going to let you answer first, and then, Kyla, you answer second, please. Um, and yeah, we've got some so time. I think, I think that's a great question. First, I want to say I hope everybody on this call today, and if you can tell three more people, to be thinking about how you prepare for what we kind of call the Ford impact, right? And I want to level set that it's not just Ford that is coming with 6,700 jobs. It is their level one, level two, level three suppliers, all of which are bringing 500 or more jobs a piece. I mean, at the end of three years, fourth year and fifth year, you know, we can guess that, um, you know, if you assume that an advanced industry creates four jobs for every one that it brings and let's just round up to 7,000 for Ford. We're talking upwards of 28,000 job openings over the course of a five to 10 year period. Um, so that's what we mean when we're talking about the Ford impact. So I want to say a couple of things. First, make sure that you understand that number. Second, don't count yourself out as being affected because you're not in manufacturing or you're not in welding. The reality is, is that Ford is building a city and all of their manufacturers are starting from the ground up. So that means they're hiring the security guard person at the gate. They're hiring people to answer the phone. They're hiring nurses. They're hiring business support services like accountants, payroll, human resources. As a matter of fact, Blue Oval has already hired two human resource <laughs> positions from Tennessee. Um, and so that will continue to multiply an effect. So don't count yourself out as not having impact. Next, and this is kind of my talking point, 
Look across your landscape. Any employee that has been with you fewer than three years is at risk for jumping, right? Particularly if they're younger because they like new experiences and these are going to be quality jobs. And so be thinking about once you identify those employees that have been with you for less than three years, what are those roles? And how do I develop an earlier, younger pipeline to backfill those roles as my talent leaves me? You can't just hope that as people leave, you're pulling something up on LinkedIn and Indeed, and that you're going to get the talent pool that you want. Those days are gone. So be thinking tactically with the math, right? Who is, what are the positions of the people that have been with me for not very long that might leave or more likely to leave? How do I backfill that if I could not advertise and hope that somebody was just walking in off the street? What's my strategy going to be like? Everybody needs a strong talent pipeline strategy and a strong stick strategy. And what I mean by stick strategy is to keep people from leaving you, or we could really call that culture, right? Um, some people chase dollars most people don't. I will be honest. Of everything that we are hearing from the pandemic, it is about culture. It is about work environment. It is about access to benefits, including good health insurance, good vacation and sick pay um, without having to wait, you know, five years to be able to take a two week vacation because you're only earning one day every two months, for example. Be thinking about the things that you can change in your stick strategy to make your workplace the best place to work. And when people leave you, and they will, don't take it personally, right? Just be ready to pivot with those strategies that you're going to be thinking tactically about. And that is really also where the American Job Centers can come in, um, to if, particularly if you have an existing relationship. Don't wait until you're in trouble to have a relationship with your workforce board, right? I mean, pipeline development is actually their core business. And so have those relationships to help you think about your talent development now. Kyla. Yeah, I, I second all, everything that Amity says, um, really for us, when we are talking to both employers and job seekers, but really job seekers, there is an unspoken shift, value shift in American workers and we are slow to absorb that really as the employers, right? Um, what does that look like? The five cents an hour, even the dollar more an hour is not what is going to do it for them. Folks want to be seen, folks want to be heard, folks want to be uh, to feel valued and see a trajectory for themselves. Um, if I feel like I am going to be stuck picking and packing at the hub for the next 20 years, I'm out. That's not what I'm going to do. So as, as employers, we really have to do a good job of setting very clear mobility pipelines for folks. What does this job lead to? What are the opportunities? If I stay, I can move into. How am I as an employer going to invest in your training and education to keep you um, on that trajectory? How am I going to support you? What am I going to connect you to as far as resources to ensure that you can do that? We say all the time, we are happy to sit down with any business and really talk very honestly about where you are and what we need to put into place. That's part of what the American Job Center is there to do. And especially on the board side, um, some of the, the higher level conversations that we have on the board are very open conversations with employers to say, here's where the gaps are. Here's why folks are leaving you. Um, here's what you need to invest in um, as a strategy, because that, that Ford effect is going to hit everyone. I, I want to be clear that you are going to feel it. No one is Ford proof. Um, we are more than happy to have them for the economic transition this community will make, but you need to start that relationship and that building of culture and that building of a real loyalty with your team now. You also have to think about who are my candidates. So simple things like, Am I saying that a job requires a bachelor's degree when it actually doesn't? Um, it actually could be skills-based. Am I, am I taking folks out of the mix of my talent pipeline before they even get started? Um, do I have a bot still scanning resumes and weeding folks out that really could be candidates for me, but I'm using AI to do that? 
Um, reentry, how open am I to reentry candidates? Is that a pipeline I'm willing to develop? So I think it forces all of us to look at our hiring practices as well as our culture to really think how we can be most flexible to make sure we're capturing all of the pockets of, of employees that are potential employees that are out there. Because for a long time, we've had the job market and then we've had the hidden job market, right? All of those folks that are not working on the books, they have side jobs, they have gig, the gig economy. How are we bringing them into judicial employment? And that's going to be a complete shift for us in how we are thinking about it from an employer perspective. Bobby, can I jump in if you don't yes. mind on that hang, question? Hang tight, hang tight. One second, Bakar, because and yes, but what <laughs> Amity and Kyla said and what you're about to speak to, um, this all starts with communication with your workforce. <laughs> for companies and company leaders who are not used to getting out there and spending five minutes with every single person in your workforce. How are you? How are you doing? What do you want to do? How can we help you? And it was easy. It was easy for the longest time. We had the jobs, the workers came to us. It hasn't now. So yes, communication, you're all talking about culture and communication. Bakari, yes, please to you. Thank you. I, I actually wanted to jump in. I know you had a separate question for me, but you know, we have a saying at Matter that uh, retention is recruitment. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have really turned our efforts uh, to employee engagement. Uh, we spend as much or more time and resources on employee engagement than we do recruiting right mm -hmm. now. Um, if we have a workforce in theory of 300 people and you would want everybody to bring one person, if you have 300 miserable people, they're not going to go <laughs> recruit 300 more people. And right. so uh, something as simple as having mem pops on pops weekend, Father's Day weekend, yeah. you know, there was, there more, I saw more smiles at Matter that day than yeah. I think I have seen the entire year that I've been at Matter from pops yeah. And so it is really the little things. But also, yeah. I also want to shift and say I'm a I'm a glass is half full as opposed to half empty type of person, which is why mobility is so important. It's an important part of this uh, mega site development because I, I heard a little fear in that question about are my employees going to take all the jobs at the mega site? But we have a real opportunity. We have a real opportunity to make our jobs and to make our region attractive for those families that are moving to the area to take those jobs. Because the reality is all of those jobs aren't going to come from Memphis. Right. That's just factual. And so in theory, the people that move to take those jobs, they may have spouses, they may have children, they may have other loved ones that relocate to the area. So we have an area, we have an opportunity uh, as businesses in this region to make our jobs through the quality of life offerings and things like that. That's why mobility, mobility is what's going to make the, dif the distance between that mega site and Memphis a lot closer. And right. so it, yeah. it works. Well. I want to say this, Dottie, that a smart employer right now is thinking about paid placement social media in the cities where Ford is already located. That's the closest to us, Kentucky, Detroit, and then kind of working way out, not mm -hmm. necessarily advertising to hire, but just branding your industry and your employment employer brand in front of the people in those cities, because there will be transplants. There will be a natural gravitation um, of employers with their trailing spouses to this region. And the more brand and name recognition you have when they get on the ground, the more likely it is they're gonna start looking for you for placement for those trailing spouses and older older, older children that are coming with them. Bakara, while we've got you, I'm gonna throw this question to you and this was a good one. Can a third party such as an employer schedule and pay for a matter ready ride for an employee or a group of employees? Order yes. a pickup spot and a drop off spot. Short answer is yes. Good. And so they can contact us on our information line, uh, get a live person. We will, we can help you coordinate that effort. Um, that's exactly what the employers did on President's Island. Um, okay. The Groove Service was not originally servicing that area. And they reached out to us and said, hey, we need a transportation solution uh, for our employees. And that's how we were able to actually expand uh, our groove services. So uh, we look for reasons to say yes. 
And so we just need people to contact us and to involve us in the conversation, bring us to the table so that we can help come up with those creative solutions for getting your employees to your businesses. Okay. Um, and we have a couple of questions. One, I think you all have answered and, and I think the fear about Blue Oval just simply needs to go away. Um, this again, Bakar is for you. Okay. Have you just got a cheat sheet of relay routes that we can get to our employees about the new programs? Is there some quick cheat sheet that you, um, either on your site that you can get to us? On There's on the site, but I'll be glad to provide you with information that you can send out to your membership roster or to those who are attending. Great. Um, but you. all the information that you need is actually found on the www.mattertransit.com. Uh, and again, if you have further questions, you can always reach out to our information line Good. and we'll be glad to answer any questions that you have, but I'll, I'll get you a fast facts form. Thank you. And Kyla, this one is for you and it's about re-entry candidates. Um, information, what companies need to do, what they need to be aware of, are the types of roles that they can fill. Can you tell us a little bit, more, please, more about the reentry program? Yeah, so we're happy to help walk anyone if they have specific job-related questions about do, does this candidate qualify for this, and we can walk through those. But reentry candidates are a pool that is a special population for us. We have a lot of dedicated funding directly for that. We're actually getting ready to open the first American Job Center in Tennessee that is behind the walls of a prison. So Mark Luttrell, uh, we will, they already have training programs, right, that are happening there. But there has been no connection point before those folks leave incarceration to a job on the outside. And so that's what role the American Job Center is going to play. We want every one of those individuals who is leaving and coming into the community to already have a job on the back end on the day that they exit. And so we are working with employers actively to help identify that. What are your needs? Um, what roles could that potentially be? Um, there is even the opportunity for work release for you to start getting those individuals at your work site before their official release date. Uh, they do it quite a good bit in North uh, North Tennessee. So it's a uh, training program that they do that we are going to be bringing here with advanced manufacturing, but it can apply to lots of things. So if you are interested in candidates that particularly are returning citizens, get with the American Job Center. You can reach out to myself or Woody. We can connect you through that. Um, we can also work through the bonding process for any of those individuals to make sure that they are bonded, um, insured and bonded. We can work through any of the pre-screening that you would like to have on those candidates. And all of the services, when I talk about OJT and paying wages of that, is also applicable to those individuals. So they are at a 75 reimbursement rate, 75%. So if you hire one of those individuals, I will pay, reimburse those wages for the first six months for 75%. Um, so it really is a candidate pool we have not tapped into. We are also really heavily involved in doing a pilot program with those that are in transitional housing from substance use. Most of those individuals have an offender history, um, but we are connecting to employers too who are ready to give second chances to those individuals with very intensive wraparound support. We are checking in with those individuals every single day to make sure they're showing up, they're doing everything they need to do on a job. So when you're going into that space and you're taking what is perceived to be a risk on some of those candidates, you are going to get a higher level of wraparound services for that person because we are heavily engaged in trying to make sure that they are a good employee for you. One quick follow-up. Do all of the candidates coming to the reentry program have felonies in their background or some? Okay, that's important because there are yes. several, several of our companies and several of our clients who can't hire convicted felons, but can for misdemeanor and other things. That's and I will say it's the entire for everybody. gamut. If you have had interaction with the justice system, so it doesn't even something that doesn't mean adjudicated, it could be a youth that has had a diversion program, any of those will count as reentry candidates, um, not necessarily, it's the entire spectrum. Great. And Amity, I'm going to throw one back to you, and this has to be STEM, and this is just a self-promoting thing. Um, there are several organizations in the city that are working with seventh and eighth graders on robotics programs and STEM programs and want to become more involved. Do they reach out to you directly so that so that we can become more involved in that? We know how successful the programs are and how excited the kids are in the seventh and eighth grade. And if we can grab them then, how do we keep moving them forward through those STEM programs? I 
was that a two part question? Can we reach out to me directly? Always, always. And um, yes, uh, either Sandra and I, and here's what I'll say about that. Schools are busy. They want these relationships, but we're happy to make sure that the relationship is forged and it is sustained before we let it go because we know that you're busy, schools are busy, and we're happy to be that bridge between you, right? And that seventh and eighth grade, the more we can build that exposure and involvement, the better off we're going to be. I would also say that it's more like third grade. I think many of you have heard me say third grade is when kids start thinking about um, what a real career looks like because they realize they can't fly and webs don't come out of their fingers. Um, and so once they realize they can't be a superhero, they start ideating on the things that they could be when they grow up and they start looking around the landscape at what they're exposed to, whether that's the adults in their home or the people in their school. Um, and they don't, they don't know what they can be if they don't have the exposure. So providing that exposure in STEM, robotics, early engineering, really helps to formulate their career goals and career paths. And there's a lot of research now, Dottie, that says that that early exposure in elementary and middle school actually does prove and it helps students persist into those engineering majors in college with engineering degrees. By the time they get into high school and they're supposed to start choosing advanced courses, if they haven't had exposure in the sciences and particularly STEM, they will not choose courses yeah. that in advanced coursework that would prepare them for an engineering or robotics pathway. So the earlier, the better. You don't have to be a STEM expert. You don't have to be a robotics expert to actually put your hands on kids and help with STEM exposure. Right. We have lots of ways that that comes prepackaged with Lego, um, with Waz Ed. You just have to be able to, if you can lead a vacation Bible school lesson or a Girl Scout lesson or a Boy Scout lesson, you can help build STEM exposure. I'll leave it Absolutely. at that. Absolutely. Thank you. And I think um, all of you have talked about culture and how critical it's going to be for success within our companies and keeping our, our employees with us. Yeah. Following right along that, um, Small Business Council is going to give everybody the month of July off, go vacation somewhere <laughs> cool. Alaska would be good this time of year right now for Memphis. We're all heading that way not soon. Um, but on August the 18th, our next Lunch in the Know, we will welcome Brad Fetterman, who's going to talk to us about emotional intelligence. But if you have missed it, Brad also has just published a book on culture, and it's mm -hmm. a snap quick and he's going to talk about culture and creating and, and retaining culture in our organizations and that will be a lunch in the know fingers crossed we can see you in person if not it'll be screen time for us again we're going to take it easy and make sure we're all safe and healthy um patricia do you do you want to jump in here to close your mic is off or do you want there can you do this okay can, can you hear me now Yes, we can. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, just thank you all so much for taking time to um, just, this was, this is, I mean, I have a lot of notes here. So I hope that you all have notes as well, but feel free to reach out to us. This is a recorded uh, event. So we will get that to you uh, as soon as we can. Um, also, as Dottie was talking about, our next event will be in, uh, in August, but we will have an event each month so what Patricia said is that we'll put up at the very end of the meeting, a link to the small business survey. And if there are any programs that you or your small businesses want, if there's some pressing issue that you want us to focus on, please let us know. Bokara, Amity, Kyla, thank you for your kindness and your time today. We appreciate it. It is 1245, guys. We're going to give you 15 minutes of your hot day back. And thank you for joining your small business council today. Hopefully we all learned how to break through barriers to a full workforce. Thanks everybody.